We're closing out a series this weekend entitled Make It Matter. And uh, if you haven't watched the, the series, I would encourage you to go back and watch that. And, uh, and this weekend, I'm doing a little tag team, so I'm going to kind of kick it off, and then I have a little special guest that's going to help me um, finish it. But uh, I, I, I've been thinking about the power of God and the presence of God in our lives and how much God loves us. I want you to look at me. God loves you. He loves you. No matter how many mistakes you've made, he loves you. He cares for you. Let me qualify that with this. How many of you are parents? Raise your hand if you're parents. Raise your hand if you're parents. Okay, then you understand this. Have you ever just, you're like, mm, your kid makes you so mad? You're just like, mm. have you ever grit your teeth? Like, I think it may just be an American culture thing, or maybe it's all over the world. I don't know. But like, you're just like, what's wrong with you? Like, but you still love them, right? Like, you're like, I just, I want you to go to the other room. I don't want to look at you, but it is your room and you can go to it. Like, you don't kick them out of the house. Like, we were watching the game last night. And if you're a Braves fan, God loves you, forgives you. <laughs> but my son, my own son, my own son started doing this right here with... with so I, I, I'm not playing, I didn't do that. But his mother told him, he's like, hey, you keep that up, you're gonna sleep on the roof tonight. It was Gunner, and he's four, and he started crying. <laughs> and I didn't back off of it. I was like, that's right, you will sleep on the roof, son. He's like, go Astros. I was like, okay, you can have your room back, all right? But we, we were just joking. I, I love my kids. I deeply love my kids. In fact, a few uh, m m uh, months ago, uh, Carla and Jillian went with me to preach a women's conference. And what we didn't know was the hotel that they put us at, they were also having Comic-Con. Okay, that, okay, there you go. Some of you guys know what Comic-Con is. If you don't know what Comic-Con is, just Google it. Um, Houston has one uh, a couple times a year. They have Comic-Con. Now, you have to understand, the Houston Comic-Con, so this is for people who are comic fans, comic book fans, or, or like Avengers movies fans, and they, and they dress up in costumes. In Houston, the costumes are amazing. Like, we have some photographers at our church that, that go down there and take pictures. Just unbelievable. I've never been, but I've seen some of them. Just unbelievable costumes. In, uh, in Minnesota, not so much. I think they went to like Walmart and maybe, they didn't even go to Target. They were just like, Walmart will work, you know? Maybe the fabric shop. And so, uh, so when we walked into the hotel, they were everywhere and Jillian was with me. And she just looks around and she like gets close to me. And when we got on the elevators, me and Jillian and Carla were on the elevator going up to our rooms and, and, and two ninjas um, get on and a really bad Pikachu, okay? <laughs> Like Pikachu that looked like he just rolled around in mud. It was a dirty costume. He got on. And, uh, and Jillian's looking, and I thought she might be scared. So I got close to her. And then I looked at her face, and she was going. Like it wasn't a scared look. <laughs> when they all got off the elevator, the elevator doors had not even really closed. She goes, Dad. I said, what? She goes, we're surrounded by nerds. <laughs> And I knew where she got that from because she's my daughter. But I also felt really bad because I was like, babe, we can't call people that, you know. So I had this whole conversation with her. And then that night when we came back from the conference, um, it was a decidedly different crowd. It was a much more scary costume crowd. And we walked around the corner. You got to understand, I was not prepared for this. I'm a dad. I walked around the corner, and there was this group of about five dudes, and they were dressed as very, very scary characters. And, uh, and one of them was growling. He started growling. And when he started growling, I did too, okay? Because I got my daughter, and I'm like, okay, so I have, I have a grown daughter who's 24, and then I have a nine-year-old. I don't want either, none of them, number one, I don't want anybody messing with either one of them, but I don't want you to put fear in this daughter because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind, and I will fight you, okay? And so, and so I started talking loud, and I was like, well, I'll tell you right now, if anybody scares my daughter, we're gonna throw hands right here at the elevator bank. Well, Carla gets embarrassed. She's like, Dad, you're being really loud. And I got louder. I was like, I know I'm being loud. I just want everybody to know that everything needs to stay copacetic or we're going to have a problem. And if we have a problem, I'm happy to have a problem with anybody here. Nobody's going to scare the nine-year-old. This dude keeps growling. She says, maybe, maybe, Dad, maybe he's in character. I said, oh, I'm in character too. I'm in character too, except in my character, in my, in my movie, my character whips his character, Okay. He stopped growling. It was awesome. And I felt a little bad about it because I, I was a pastor. But in that moment, I was a dad. Amen? 
And then I thought about it. If God, if I love my daughter that much to preemptively let everybody know, don't mess with my kids. Now, if you don't understand danger, see, part of diffusing danger is to let people know ahead of time, hey, something will happen if you do something. Okay, so I'm just letting you know, okay? If I love my kids that much, the Bible says how much more does your heavenly father love you? He wants to give good gifts to you. And so I can tell you this, God loves you. He is fighting for you. He is with you. And he has already won the victory. Aren't you grateful that we serve a victorious God? And the love of God matters. God loves us so much that oftentimes he surrounds us with people to strengthen us, to lift us up, to help us, to hold our arms up. I was watching, and if you know anything about baseball, it is a, it is a cerebral game. It can be boring, but it's a cerebral game, and, and it's all about making sure that the pitching team is working together and working well. And we don't typically expect one pitcher to go the whole game. They can, but they're constantly coming out and checking. And we have relief pitchers. Aren't you grateful for relief pitchers who can come in and win a game? We, we need y'all to do that. I love our team, man. But I'm grateful that I, don't, that I don't pastor by myself. Hasn't Daniel Groves done a phenomenal job this year just preaching and we've tag teamed a lot. And this weekend, I'm bringing somebody else to help the, the Lord's, I was prepared and planned and actually feel good. I've had some, some adrenal issues this year that I just some energy stuff that I'm dealing with and trying to work on, but I actually felt really good about preaching this weekend. But the Lord told me, the Lord spoke to me and, and told me who was supposed to preach this weekend. And I don't often feel that, but I felt it very, very strongly. And, uh, and so I'm excited to have her come and preach this weekend. And, uh, and it, it, I, I believe that God empowers women to strengthen the church and strengthen the body. In fact, I heard, uh, I heard Grace Klein say this one time. She said her pastor in California used to get up and he would say, and she said, this is what gave her the courage to become what God has called her to become. And she's a powerhouse woman of God. But she said her pastor would get up and he would say, I believe the next Billy Graham is going to come from this church and I can't wait to meet her. And I love that statement because y'all, we need to raise strong and powerhouse young women of God who believe that they can do the things of God. And I believe that. And the lady that I'm going to bring to you is a powerhouse woman of God. She's highly, highly educated, very, very smart, but she's also street smart. I believe that she could explain the deep things of God, but if you mess with her kids, I think she could cut you. <laughs> Would you please stand on your feet right now and welcome my friend, a lady who has been a blessing to us. She is the wife of Daniel Groves. Please welcome Jackie Groves to this stage right now. I love you, Jack. You're going to do great. Hey, everybody. Have a seat. Good to see you all today. Don't you just love our pastor? Oh my goodness, he always keeps things so enjoyable and it makes coming to church fun, doesn't it? I love it, I love it. I'm so thrilled to be with you all today. You usually get my buddy. You usually get my, my guy, the bearded one, my better half over there, but you get me this weekend, right? Hey! I'm excited. I am thrilled about what I know that the Holy Spirit has placed in my heart to share with you all today. How many of you have been enjoying the series that we have been in, this Make It Matter series? Yeah, it's been huge. Pastor Jeremy has talked about how to make today matter and how to take the practical pieces to make today important. And then he also talked about how to seek the significance of God as opposed to just success. And then Pastor Daniel came in and he preached about how to find the purpose of God, the God-designed, hand-specific, just-for-you purpose that is on your life, and then how to steward that well. Y'all, this series is really really, really important because how many of you have ever been guilty of just being too busy in life? Being too busy. People ask you, how's your day? How's your day going? You're like, oh, it's just so busy. I just feel so busy. Or how's your week? What'd you guys do this week? And you were like, I, I can't tell you. I was just, I was so busy. I was so busy. I find myself doing that all the time, but the truth is it's not actually an answer. That's actually just a distraction. But we have to know, we have to know that what the Bible says, what the Bible says about what these screens say is how to leave your mark how to make it matter, and how to make a difference instead of just rushing through it in survival mode. Ephesians 5, 15 and 16 says to be very careful then how you live, 
not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, making it matter. So today I am going to be sharing with you all about how to make the struggles matter, how to make the unexpected challenges and difficulties and hard times and painful seasons, how to not let them steal your purpose, your significance, and your joy in your story. Amen? Today I want to share with you a little bit about my story. I want to share about a time when I was in college, and I actually just shared this with our staff just recently. And the reason that I shared it is because I realized it was the very first time that I had as a grown-up to make my own decision about how to make my situation matter and how to make it significant. And it marked me. It literally marked me so much, so much, that I keep this little piece. I don't always keep it in my pocket, everybody. But I do keep this piece with me because it is a gentle reminder of what God taught me in this season. So when I was in college... I was pre-med and undergraduate, and we were going on a one-month medical missions trip. We were going to Papua New Guinea. It's that small little country right above Australia. It was going to be amazing. We had prepared. My team and I had prepared and prepared and prepared. I mean, we had prepared every area we could think to prepare. We'd prepared medically. We'd prepared spiritually. We'd prepared physically. We had done every ounce of preparation that we could think to do. But we weren't quite prepared for what we were getting ready to encounter. Of course, you never are. But we took one week's rope course right before we went on our trip, and that was to bond us as a team. And at this ropes course, the very, I think it was the second day that we got there, I was heading back to our cabin after the night of chapel, and we were walking down this dirt road, and there were railroad ties on the side of the dirt road, and it had rained that day. And I was a college kid, so I was wearing flip-flops. So I was like, I'm not going to walk on this muddy area. I'm going to walk on the railroad ties. This makes so much more sense. And as I was stepping up on these railroad ties, I literally, as as clear as I can possibly explain to you, I heard a warning, watch out for that right there. And so I legitimately, in the dark, couldn't see it. I wouldn't have seen it. I look down and I see this pretty little piece sticking up out of the railroad tie. Now, you guys, I'm sure you're super smart, so you can probably deduce that this guy didn't stay in the railroad tie because he encountered me at that point. In the moment, I thought, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead. I'm going to do the smart thing. I'm going to jump right over it, right? I'm just going to skip over it, and I won't, I won't, I won't, this will be easy. This will make it better. I won't walk around it. That could get me hurt, Right? wasn't my best decision. Unfortunately, I fell right smack dab on this here piece of rebar wire and destroyed my leg pretty significantly in that moment. But after lots and lots of stitches, lots and lots, the doctor said, it's going to be okay. You can go to Papua New Guinea. Just, you're going to have to walk on some crutches for a little bit. I was like, okay, I can do that. As long as it doesn't ruin what I had planned for, then I can do it. So I was a good girl. I was on those crutches for as many days as I needed to. We went to our to Papua New Guinea. The second day we were there, we took my stitches out. The next day after that, we went on our big trip. We were going into what they call the bush. It's the remote villages of Papua New Guinea. It's a four-hour hike up and a four-hour hike down. And we got all the way up the mountain. And we got not all the way down the mountain before I yet encountered encountered another unplanned disappointment, and I fell, and I hurt my leg, same leg, in another way this time, but our team and I, we were like, Ugh. our training evidently wasn't that good, because we were like, it's just a sprain, walk it off, walk it off, you can do this, so for two hours, y'all, for two hours, I walked, and I tried to hike the best I could, but what we did not know was my leg was broken, and my ankle was broken, and my foot was fractured, and for two hours, I tried to tough it out and to just push through. I have never experienced that kind of disappointment in my life or frustration in that moment. After we got long and short of the story, after we got into the village, because it was the only place we could go, we were hours from the city. After we got into the village, I was stuck in a hut for five days on my back, nowhere to go, my leg turning black all the way up. I didn't know what I would do. Finally found a doctor, finally. They got us out of there, found a doctor, got me casted up to my mid-thigh, and they said, you have two options, okay? You got two options, you could just go home. You could go home, you put in a good effort, you really tried, this isn't your plan, but you could go home. Or you could stay 
And the, the mission base, it's up on a hill, so you wouldn't be able to go down to any of the activities. And, and honestly, there's a lot of stairs in the house, so you wouldn't actually be able to leave one room in that house either. Um, but you could stay for the rest of the month, because I said it's a month-long mission trip, or you could go home. And so I, I'm not a quitter, y'all. I take a lot of pride in being strong. Um, but I thought, okay, okay, maybe I'm going home. And they said, but you'll have to take somebody with you. And so in that moment, I decided that either I had to make a choice for me or make a choice for somebody else. And I chose someone else. And I stayed in that mission house in one room for a whole month, so, so frustrated and so upset and so hurting, physically in pain, physically confused, completely shocked as to what happened, asking God the entire time, why? Why did this happen? Why am I going through this? I sought you on this. I heard from you on this. I don't understand why I am in this incredibly difficult spot that I don't know anybody that would be fine to be in this place. And you know what I heard from the Lord more than anything else? He said, focus on me. Stop focusing on you. And in that moment when I said, okay, okay, I'll stop focusing on, I'll stop focusing on me for a second. I'll focus on you, Lord. And in that moment, I became determined to not let it be wasted. To not let all of the time and all of the effort and all the energy that my team and myself had invested to get to this point that turned out different than I expected, to not let it be wasted, to not all, let all the resources that were sewn into my life, people paid for me to go and sit in that room for as long as I did, to not let it be wasted. I refuse to let it be wasted. Pastor Daniel talked last week about how God doesn't waste anything. Every opportunity, every mistake, every pain, he can turn it for good and develop an incredible purpose to arise from it. One of my very favorite scriptures is Romans 8, 28. And that says, and we know that in all things, not just some things, not the things that you could figure out, not the things that you could plan, not the things that you could find a way out of, but in all things, God works for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Y'all, my trip to Papua New Guinea that I just told you about, it was nuts. It was absolutely craziness. It was one of the hardest things that I've ever done. And I've been married for 17 years. We got four kids. We've been through a lot of things. But it was by far, up to date, one of the hardest things I've ever done. And I realized in that moment that it was my choice to make my situation matter and not let it be wasted. To own Romans 8, 37 that says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. That means that there is no situation, no issue, no problem, no struggle that is bigger than us. We are bigger than all of those things. But the next part of this scripture does not say on our own, in our very own strength. It says through him. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us who loved us. And the truth is that life is full of these moments. It is full of these challenges and these unexpected difficulties and struggles and disappointments and sometimes losses. This whole series is about making our lives and our choices and our actions matter. However, not all things in this life happen by our choosing, right? Not all things that we experience are because we chose it but we always have a choice in how we respond, always. When we have to walk through the fire and there is no way around the fire whatsoever, how do we make it matter? How do we make the sacrifices that you make every day to be in the place that you are? How do we make those matter? How do we make all of the work that you have put in to overcome, how do we make that significant? How do we find that joy? How do we find our trust again? How do we use those unexpected difficulties, those things we were not planning on, and how do we turn them into focus for our day and purpose and strength and power that God is calling us to? Because y'all hear me, what you have been through, maybe what you are in the middle of right now, it can either be your future's prison walls or it can literally be the trampoline that you bounce right on up out of into your freedom, into your purpose, and into the hope that God has called you to. Amen? Amen. So to make the struggles matter, number one, 
Number one, you have to know the hope of God versus just knowing about it. It's one thing to hear about the goodness of God, the God that saves, heals, delivers, redeems. It's one thing to hear about that, but it is an entirely different one to really know him in relationship through his word and in prayer, to know his nature, to have history with him, to know what God has done for you before and have the confidence that he can do it again because you remember what he did before, to be able to recognize his presence when you are in his ministry to be able to know the God that you serve so that when he's trying to get your attention and still your heart, you know. It's very different to know him versus to know about him. Daniel, would you come up here for a moment? I want you to help me demonstrate something. Y'all, would you welcome my husband this morning? He was told he didn't have to come up, but I'm still making him come up just for a minute. So those of you that know, yes, this is my husband. So we've been married, like I said, for 17 years. We have, thank you. We were best friends for five years before that. We've got four kiddos, one baby in heaven. We have had a life together. I mean, I don't just know about this guy. I legitimately know him. Like to hear him describe it, I can read his mind, right? Right? You would say that I could probably read your mind. That's absolute facts. Yeah. That's and guys, I knew that he would say that, so there's that. So I'm gonna ask our dream team to come out here and help me with something really quickly. Because the thing is, I think that a lot of the time in life, we find ourselves in situations like this, where we legitimately feel hemmed in on every side and not in a protected kind of way, in an overwhelming kind of way. I am a small woman on the middle of a large circle of men and sometimes life can feel like this. Sometimes life can feel like I don't have any way out. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know what the solution to this is. And it's in these moments that we have to be able to know beyond a shadow of a doubt where our safe place is, where our safe spot is in life. We have to know, I have to know in this moment where my guy is because he represents my safe place for me. And if I look around this circle, if all I know is about my guy, if I look around all that is closing me in and holding me in and holding me pinned back and making me feel claustrophobic and like I, I can't catch my breath in here. If I only look around and I think about the things that I, that I think about him, that I might know about him. Like, okay, if I find a beard, maybe that's him. If I, if I find a shaved head, maybe that's him. If I find somebody that's tall, maybe, maybe that's him. But that is exactly what the enemy wants is because in a moment, in a moment when the enemy begins to try to distract your heart, you have to know the voice of God. Have to know the voice of God. And because... Because I know him when he calls for me. I can pick him out in a crowd. I can find him in a crowd with ease. And at the very moment that the enemy sees you holding on to your hope, he flees in all directions. He flees in all directions. And Pastor Daniel is a visual representation. Thank you, darling. He's a visual representation of a safe place because you all know that I know him. But in the real reality of life, our hope is only firm when we know the God that we serve, when we know where our ultimate hope comes from. Hosea 6 verse 3 says, Oh, that we might know the Lord. Let us press on to know him, not just know about him, but to know him. And he will respond to us as surely as surely as the arrival of dawn or the coming of rains in early spring. And in order to hold your peace in the middle of a battle, you have to be so well acquainted with your source that the storms of life don't rattle you to your roots. Now, don't let me, don't let me lie to you. You absolutely will feel at times that the ground may shake below you. You will. Don't doubt that. There will be those moments that you will feel the ground shake. But Psalm 34, verses 23 and 24 says, The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. He may stumble, but he will not fall. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. 
If you lose sight of your hope, if you lose trust in the promises of God, then you distance yourself from your strength for the day, for today, because that's what we need is our strength for this day so that we can make it to tomorrow and be even stronger tomorrow and make it to next week and be even stronger next week. But we need strength in this day. And when you know the hope of God and you truly know it, not just know about it, but you truly know it, then God can demonstrate his hope through you in the midst of the hard things. And he can deliver that peace and that joy and even that salvation to those around you because of what you have been walking through in spite of it. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Amen, amen. And that is not just our own weakness. That is literally the weakness of a moment, the vulnerability of a moment. That's when God steps in and says, I'm big. Y'all, I'm big. I'm bigger than what you're facing. That is so small compared to me. I am bigger than that. We have to know the hope and the promises of God. Number two, this one gets me a little bit excited. Choose to see the victory already in your story. Choose to see the victory that is already there. You see, God already wrote victory into your story long before the pain ever entered in. Long before that, no matter how far off guard your situation has taken you or how much longer it is taking you to process something than you anticipated, it did not take God by surprise. Not for a moment. Not for a moment is he confused about it because he forever has the answer for how you deal and where to turn in his word to provide you with the comfort of knowing that guess what guys, you win. This will not defeat you. The only thing that defeats you is your acceptance of defeat. You win. And that has already been written into your story and God wants to give you a way out. He's always providing one. Psalm 24 verse five says, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their savior. I wanna share with you a story this morning from the Bible about one of my favorite people in the Bible. And her name is Rahab. And one of the reasons that she is one of my absolute favorite is because she was literally a prostitute in her day. And she is also one of the most well-renowned people found in the Bible. And so often we as Christians and the world say that God can't do anything with something so ugly. God can't do anything with something so messy. God can't do anything with something that made so many poor choices or found themselves in such a bad spot. But that is not what the word of God says at all. God can vindicate, redeem, and restore in a simple moment, just like he did with Rahab. So with the story of Rahab, I'll catch you up a little bit and give you a little bit of a summary. You can find the full story in Joshua chapter two. But what was happening here is what had happened right before is Moses had taken the Israelites and they had crossed the Red Sea, right? This is where the waters parted. We'd seen that miracle. And then they wandered in the desert for 40 years. They struggled to be obedient to what God was asking of them. They struggled to follow after him. They followed after false gods and idols. They struggled. So for 40 years, they struggled. They didn't get to their promised land. Then Moses passed away and Joshua stepped in as leader. And yet again, God brought Joshua and the Israelites right to another body of water. And he said, you're gonna have to cross this. But this time he said, but this is it. Right on the other side of this is the very promise I have for you. This is the promised land. Right there, you're gonna take that city of Jericho and I'm gonna give you all the instructions on how to do it. And he did. And Joshua decided, I'm gonna send two spies. I'm gonna send them right in because Jericho was the most prominent. It was the biggest, the wealthiest city in all of the Jordan Valley. So he needed to see what was happening in there. Who was in this city? What was it that they were up against? Because they'd already been through a lot, right? They'd already faced down a lot. So they sent their two spies in and those two spies came to the home of Rahab. And the crazy thing about this story this city, Jericho, it was inhabited by seven different people groups of 
very, very sinful, pagan, idol-worshiping, everything bad and evil that you could possibly anticipate was in this city. Rahab was one of these people. She was a Canaanite. The Canaanites were known to be the known enemies of the Israelites. However, when these men came to her door, she did not turn them away. She brought them into her home. She sheltered them so much so that when the king came to her home and said, we know that the Israelite spies are there, the king's men, they said, give them up. She said, oh, well, I had no idea that they were Israelite spies. They actually just left. They went this way. Go that way. Run right now. You might even have a chance to catch them. Go. So not only did she just pretend like she didn't know who they were. She lied entirely because she'd already hidden them up on top of her roof and she was in the middle of this. She was entirely invested into it. But why? Let's look really quickly into the book of Joshua chapter two, verses eight through 11. It says, before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and she said to them, I know that the Lord, this Lord that she knows nothing about, mind you, this is not the Lord that she serves. I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard this is how she knew about the Lord. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. And when we heard of it, listen, y'all, when we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God over heaven and below. The Lord is God. So what happened in this moment was not only was God making preparations long before to redeem and restore and deliver this land into the Israelites as their promised land, but he was also at work in Rahab's life. How did he do it? Because he had already spread the story of what he was doing 40 years before at the Red Sea, all the way down here to Jericho, all the way down. His tale and his word had spread so far because he was redeeming already. Because not only, not only was, were the Israelites saved here, Rahab was saved in this story. And it's more than just a story because it's significant. God took her willingness and her obedience to just trust him to just trust him for a way out to see that not only did he have a plan for her, not only did he plan for her to marry an Israelite man herself, once a Canaanite, but her to become an Israelite herself, not only did he plan for that, but he also planned for her to become a mother. She gave birth to children, a prostitute. She gave birth to children. Her son was Boaz, the husband of Ruth. And if y'all know a whole lot about Bible background. He is in the bloodline of King David himself and our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's something worth praising about. There were five women, five women referenced, five women in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Guess who one of them was? Rahab a prostitute. They worked real hard to make her just an innkeeper so it didn't look like we had anything dirty in Jesus' past. But all that there was was the reality of what we all need redemption from. We all need the same, same redemption that Rahab needed. Don't tell me that God is not already working for your good. And don't think for a moment, that's right, don't think for a moment that God cannot make the struggles count because he was writing victory into your story so much longer than before you needed it. Number three, focus on the joy found in redemption. When you know of the redemption found in Jesus Christ, even in spite of pain, even in spite of frustrations, you know that God is not done. There was an exchange that was made the exchange was his death for our life, but there is even more promised than that. 
Isaiah 61, three says to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the exchange of the ashes for something beautiful, the exchange of the mourning for the oil of joy, the exchange of the spirit of heaviness for a garment of praise that they may be called trees of righteousness. What is a tree of righteousness and why is that significant? Because the truth is we are grounded and rooted in the word of God and a tree might shake and move around, but it will rarely be knocked down if it is grounded well. And it says, this is the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. That means God planted you. You are a child of God. You are a victor in the name of Jesus. Psalm 30 verse five says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. That's a promise that there is an end to the hard times and there is joy on the horizon. Nehemiah 8.10 says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. That means that there is new joy and more joy to be found than what you're already walking in. Psalm 51, 12 says, restore to me the joy of my salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. The willingness to see that he is at work, even if it isn't fixed yet, even if you don't see that it's fixed, the willingness to see that he is at work and trust that he is working. It is not referenced as the joy of our situation, is it? It's the joy of our salvation. The joy is not to be found in the moment that we're in that's perfect. The joy is to be found in who we find ourselves in. And his promises redeem the broken, the painful, and the disappointing. Focus on his joy. We have to make the struggles matter. The things behind cannot limit us. Fear cannot cripple us as it tries to, but we can use whatever we have walked through and we are currently walking through to be stronger, to grow deeper roots in the word of God and to be more called to what he is calling you to be closer and more aware of it. We don't always get to choose which struggles we face, but we do get to choose how we stand. Amen. Amen. Let me pray for you this morning. Lord God, I thank you for each and every single person in this room that is listening online at each of our campuses. Lord, I just thank you right now in the name of Jesus that you are covering them with such peace and truth and certainty that you go before them, that you are all around them and that you are turning it, God, that there is an exchange that they are in the middle of. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't stop before you see God at work. God, we thank you that you would be bigger in the mighty name of Jesus. Show up big in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Come on, can we, can we give Jackie a great big hand? That was, that was powerhouse. I'll tell you what, at all of our locations, I, online, I, I turned to Daniel, like I'm, I'm kind of emotional. That was awesome. Proud of her, man, she did great. But I turned to Daniel and I said, dude, I didn't even know what she was preaching. If you remember, I referenced Romans 8, 28 in the beginning. He'll work all things together for your good. And then I talked about how much Jesus loves you, how much he's fighting for you, no matter how messed up you are. And then her hook story is Rahab. God's trying to get somebody's attention here. And he used two voices to do it. He loves you. I love what she said. You can't choose what goes on in your situation, but you can't choose how you stand. You can't choose the choice, the decision that you make on how you're gonna walk through this. Don't waste it. In fact, I would tell you this, the quickest way out of your pain is through your pain. And then the quickest way through your pain is to recognize that God will use it. And when you get to that moment, you're saying lesson learned and I'm ready to apply. And the quicker you're ready to apply, the quicker God wants to use you. How many of y'all wanna be used by God? I wanna be used by God. God, God, we wanna be used. We yield to you, God. We say with open hands and open hearts, Lord, whatever you wanna do is what we want, God. We desperately need you in every area of our lives. We're desperate for you. And if you wanna be used by God and used of God, the first thing you have to do is yield to God. 
You have to take a stand for God. The Bible says when you acknowledge him, he will acknowledge you. If you're not ashamed of him, he won't be ashamed of you. And I think somebody needs to take the stand today and say, I'm not ashamed, I'm broken, and I desperately need Jesus. If that's you, just lift your hand. I'm broken, and I desperately need Jesus. I'm broken. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hands, hands, hands. I see you, I see you, I see you. Thank you. I want us to pray this prayer at every location online. I want you to pray with me. Jesus, I trust you with my life. I've made so many mistakes. I've realized... I can't do this on my own, and I need a Savior. If all the bad things that I've done are coming back to repay me, then I can't can't do this. But if you'll cover it, it changes everything. So in this moment right now, I'm asking you to cover me. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on a cross and rose again on the third day. So in this moment, I'm asking you, Jesus, to be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.